Chapter 2 of Lord Latimer's Ladies by Margaret Elin Schmidt and Dan McLaughlin. Chapter 2 Wake Up Before you open your eyes, there are three things I should tell you. Brian thought his sister's voice sounded odd, not exactly frightened, but as if she was keyed up about something. But then, Alice always had a theatrical sense of fun, at odds with the nine-to-five corporate persona of her day job, one that made her a willing participant in pranks, performances, and an assortment of oddly themed events. Their wealthy cousin's destination wedding, with its historical costumes and expensive location, certainly qualified as fun, and Brian braced himself for a deluge of water balloons. What is it now? he asked with precisely the amount of patience to be expected from a brother woken up by his sister at the crack of dawn. Okay, Alice said, then hesitated, as if she needed a moment to gather her thoughts. First thing, you're not wearing a dress. It's called a nightshirt, and all the guys wear them here and now. Really, madam? A man's voice intruded, flat with disapproval. That is what you feel most important to convey? Brian found himself wondering where his sister had found her accomplice. He sounded like an actor, someone straight out of central casting. Was he part of the staff in the castle? The internal calculator Brian had been running to estimate the already staggering cost of Cousin Jessica's wedding ratcheted up a significant notch. Trust me. Alice was saying in a not-so-hushed aside, I know my brother. If he's going to wake up in a dress he didn't put on the night before, he's gonna freak. Even without the water balloons, Brian was beginning to wake up. Thanks to Alice, he couldn't help but notice that someone had indeed put him in a dress, and it did feel a lot more loosey-goosey than the sweatpants he remembered going to sleep in just before midnight. He had been too tired to pay too much attention to the hotel room at the time, but he was clearly still in bed. Honestly, he didn't recall the mattress being so incredibly soft when he crawled into bed to the sound of rain lashing the window overlooking the on-ramp of the 101 freeway. It had been a dark and stormy night, as several months of clear weather had ended with a tropical monsoon dumping several inches of rain on the central coast. Now it was irrefutably morning, and if he had to suffer the addition of a nightshirt, Brian reflected, there was nothing wrong with having plenty of down pillows and a comforter or two as a pleasant side effect of this prank. If it weren't for his sister and the looming threat of her impending big reveal, Brian thought he could easily have slept another couple of hours. That obviously wasn't going to be his destiny. He rubbed his eyes, and as he did so, his hand brushed across a line of fabric across his forehead. Some kind of hat? He pulled it off as a matter of course. That's a nightcap, Alice said. Goes with the night shirt. She seemed to be watching him closely. Just keep your eyes closed. Brian smiled and stretched, leisurely folding his hands behind his head. Obviously, his sister had gone to a great deal of trouble to arrange this stunt, and he was good enough of a sport to play along. Even with his eyes closed, he could tell it was going to be a nice day out. He could hear a breeze blowing, and the air smelled unusually fresh and clear, perhaps because of the rain. There wasn't a hint of noise from the nearby freeway, and he imagined he could even smell the ocean, though that was impossible given what he recalled of the location of Cousin Jessica's wedding. Now the second thing you should know, Alice said, is that we've traveled back in time. The year is 1810, and we are in a castle on the edge of Dartmoor Cliff. Nightgown, check. Time travel, check. What's the third thing? He asked in his best, playing the straight man voice. 
He knew Alice loved drawing things out, and while normally he appreciated a good laugh, he began to wonder whether this obvious prank of his weird sister's imagination was ever going to get to the point. Because now that I'm awake, let's get to the punchline. I really want some breakfast. Okay, fine. Alice sounded impatient, and Brian braced himself again against the incoming comedy barrage. Here's the third, final thing. She drew a deep breath. He could tell she thought that this was going to be the deal breaker. You have to complete a magical quest for the castle phantom before the time travel process can be reversed and we can go home. Brian laughed, relieved to know that he was no longer about to be hit by water balloons. Alice's jokes about his marital status were familiar territory. Frank's over, he thought, and opened his eyes. Ha ha, he said. Very funny. But then he froze and blinked in shock. He sat up, tempted to rub his eyes again, like a cartoon character coming out of a dream. He stopped himself with effort and looked around in growing amazement. This was not the bedroom where he had fallen asleep. That had been a perfectly ordinary hotel space, bland and impersonal, if on the pretentious side. This was something else entirely. There were no electric light fixtures, just a couple of candelabras, with actual candles, instead of light bulbs, flickering in a stately way from the tops of a variety of overly ornamented furniture. The breeze coming in from the window was not just cool, but downright brisk. It was definitely not the familiar dry air of the central California countryside. It was fresh, ocean-scented, and cool, with more than a hint of moisture in it. The room felt not just old-fashioned, but incredibly old. It actually creaked as it settled. He looked at his sister, sitting in a straight-backed, velvet-padded chair that had definitely not been there the night before. Alice was wearing something that looked like Red Riding Hood's grandmother could have loaned to a passing wolf, a distinctly antiquated nightgown, robe, and ruffled cap. She was sitting in a very un like way, with her hands clasped tightly in her lap. A stranger in a dark suit, his manner older than his physical age, was standing with deference just behind her chair, and Brian pegged him at once as the guy from Central Casting with the dignified voice. Brian quickly labeled him the butler. When Brian started a sputtering protest, this butler sort of guy lifted a hand in a gesture that indicated he was in on it as well and said, I suggest you look out the window, sir. Brian got out of bed and immediately felt ridiculous. This outfit feels like a stupid hospital thing, he said, turning in a half circle as he tried to make sure he wasn't open at the back. You will feel more comfortable in a robe, sir. The butler already had it in hand. Fine, muttered Brian, grabbing it hastily and wrapping it around his shoulders. Thank you. I can put it on myself. Except that never having worn a nightshirt and cap before, he struggled a bit with the process, and he wasn't entirely sure he was successful. The tussle to put on the robe was embarrassing, and Brian was feeling less and less inclined to play along with Alice's rendition of Ye old Jest in Time of Yore. In far from languid steps, he went to the window and pushed aside the billowing curtains to look out. He gasped. Instead of the rolling brown hills of the California coast, with the 101 gently curving to the horizon, Brian saw a vast green lawn, and beyond that, a stretch of undulating wilderness that might have been meadow and might have been a moor. And there were sheep! Even farther was a glimmering stretch of moving water that was clearly an ocean. Aside from a few buildings clearly attached to the castle, 
there seemed to be no roads or any other sign of human habitation for miles. There was definitely no parking lot and no nearby town or hotel. Instead, there was just this big rambling house that shook slightly as it continued to settle. He felt a deep, shuddering chill. The windows were definitely not double glazed. The window sill creaked a little beneath his clenched fingers and the curtains billowed in the soft sea breeze. This might help, sir. Brian spun around. The butler was doing the effortlessly competent thing and had a sheaf of papers in hand. What is that? Brian demanded. He felt off balance, his emotions spinning wildly between outrage and terror. He thought he was generally a good-natured person, but it seemed that they could be literally hundreds of years beyond his comfort zone at this point, and Brian didn't like it. We call this a newspaper, sir, was the butler's bland response. Never had the word aplomb been more apt. What the? Brian snatched the paper out of the man's hand, and the feel of it, as much as anything he'd seen so far, lent credence to Alice's far-fetched time travel story. The newspaper was nothing like he was used to. It was bigger the pages oversized and simultaneously feeling thick and cheap in his hands. The edges were ragged, the columns were dense, and there were no photographs anywhere, only sketches and drawings. The butler indicated a section of the page. In international news, my lord, you will find Napoleon has just gotten his marriage with Josephine annulled. Brian bent to look closer. Once he got past the weird typeface and the lack of white space, he was able to confirm that. Damn, he said softly. Brian looked over to his sister, who had remained in her chair, the better to let him suss out the situation on his own. It's true, Alice said. Somehow we went back in time. We are stuck here, for now. The good news is, there seems to be a way back. Wait a minute. What's going on here? And who are you? Looking for someone, anyone, to blame for this situation, Brian turned to confront the butler guy. The man gave a small bow. I am your valet, sir. Brian had heard the word before, but only in the context of parking cars. My what? The valet bowed again. My role here is to assist you as you make the transition to this time and navigate its parameters. Yeah, Brian, help. Alice and the butler seemed to have already reached some kind of accommodation and were working together to get Brian on board. Brian frowned and shook his head. What? He sputtered. Where? As your sister has already mentioned, the valet repeated the gist of what his sister had said. The year is 1810. It is late November, and Castle Dartmoor is located on an isolated place on the west coast of Britain. How? asked Brian. I don't know, said Alice, but I had a little time to look around the place. As far as I can tell, it seems to be true. The valet said, I know it's a lot to take in. You are quite stranded here. And indeed, the only way back to your own time and place is to complete the puzzle that has been set before you. When your task is finished, you should be returned from whence you came. He nipped the old-fashioned newspaper out of Brian's unprotesting hands and deftly replaced it with an equally old-fashioned and wax-sealed envelope. Unfortunately, while the valet was enunciating clearly and generally given a fine performance, the message was not sinking into Brian, who rounded on the only other person in the room in an attempt to cut through his confusion. What is he talking about? Clearly implied was a lingering suspicion that somehow Alice was connected to all this, but she spread her hands in a gesture indicating her own innocence and frustration. I don't know how it happened, Brian, 
she said deliberately. But as far as I can tell, everything he says is true. I've been up half the night, walking around, and we are nowhere near Cousin Jessica's wedding venue. While I'm not giving up on the idea that there's another way out of this mess, for now, it seems like the smart thing to do is pick up the envelope the nice man is holding out to you so we can find out what your quest is and get the heck out of Dodge. Dartmoor, my lady, the valets corrected her politely. My lady? Brian turned around again and leveled an accusing finger at the valet. Just a second here. A minute ago, you called me my lord. What's up with that? In answer, the valet held out the envelope again. In large letters and fancy outmoded writing, the words, Lord Latimer, Dartmoor Castle, had been scrawled across the top. Latimer, said Brian incredulously, but that's my name. Yes, my lord, said the valet. I'm Brian Latimer. Yes, my lord. The valet bowed again for emphasis. Take a breath, Bry, said Alice, finally getting up from the chair to lay a reassuring hand on her brother's arm. Look, I got one too. She held out another envelope, almost identical, except that it had been addressed to Lady Alice Latimer. What? Brian said. It's supposed to be instructions. A guide to the thing we have to do in order to get home, Alice explained. She seemed sympathetic, rather than impatient, but if she was telling the truth, she'd had a few more hours than Brian to get used to the idea. So you got one too? he asked. She grimaced and unfolded her letter. It seemed to be all one piece, paper thicker and heavier than newspaper, much better quality, but still clearly old-fashioned. The actual note had been written on the inside of the envelope, then folded up and sealed. Brian snatched it from Alice's hand and read, Talk to me. Talk to me, he repeated. Talk to who? Alice took the letter back and folded it again. I don't know. I'll start with everyone, though, and work my way to specifics if that's what it takes. But to be honest, I'm hoping your letter has something in it a little more concrete in it. My letter, said Brian. At his side, the valet cleared his throat in a helpful manner. Brian sighed. He felt weirdly reluctant to take up the envelope with his name on it, as if doing that would somehow make this all too real. But the only other options seemed to be running, screaming around the sheep-infested winter seaside wearing a nightgown. Fine, he said, and grabbed the letter from the valet's hand. He was ready to tear into the envelope, but as soon as he touched it, the thing began to open on its own. Brian yelped and dropped it as if it were some kind of insect, then, muttering under his breath, bent to pick it up from the floor. He read, In this house are ladies three. Ask if any are willing to marry. If one says yes, count it success. True love will homeward send thee. Brian felt a surge of relief and anger and wadded up the letter into a ball and threw it at his sister. Okay, Alice, fun time's over. Now let's get into some real clothes and get out of here. Now it was Alice's turn to be confused. She dropped down, scrambling for the paper where it had rolled under a sort of bureau. What did it say? You've been joking about my dating life for how long now? He sneered. But this level of matchmaking is crazy even for you. This is bonkers. I don't know how you did it, but I'm out. Brian looked around. Clearly, someone had to take charge. Once he was dressed, that person was going to be him. He strode to the nearest closet-shaped object and flung open the door. Where did you hide my clothes, anyways? Alice had smoothed out the crumpled letter against her knee and said, I didn't write this, Brian. You know my handwriting. I didn't. 
Well, if you didn't, then who did? Brian demanded. They say it's the castle Phantom, his sister answered. But no one really knows. The letters just appear. Mine was on the bedside table when I woke up. So was yours. That's all I was able to find out so far. He just rolled his eyes at her. Close, he snapped. Now. The valet went to a dresser and opened a drawer. Will you be requiring your writing attire, sir? His voice was impassive. Faced with a variety of costume pieces, Brian snarled in frustration. Fuck no, I'm done playing. Just give me my clothes and call me an Uber. These are your clothes, sir. Not this crap, Brian said. You know, my real clothes. In his frustration, he began to toss things out of a closet, as if his real clothes were merely hidden behind the velvet and lace. He shoved the valet aside when the man tried to stop him, and would have emptied the wardrobe down to the bare wood if Alice hadn't come over and taken his hand. Brian, she said in soothing tones that finally seemed to reach through his anger and confusion. Listen to me. Just for a minute, okay? I mean, listen. These are our clothes. Everyone here wears them, and there aren't any others. We arrived here without any other clothes. It was super embarrassing. Do you understand me? Brian turned on her. Is this some kind of joke to you? She shook her head vehemently. No, of course not. I'm just thinking we need to be practical while we figure things out. It's not like we have a lot of options here. Brian reflected with a combination of aggravation and respect that it was just like Alice, presented with any task, however inconvenient or outrageous or impossible, to simply pick up a pencil and try to figure it out. However, at the moment, Brian was not feeling the mystery room vibe. He missed his stuff, and he was frantic to get away from this freezing cold castle with its overly helpful staff members. Turning to the valet, Brian said, Again, where are our clothes? Our real clothes? Somberly, the valet shook his head. Nothing from where you were yesterday is here for you today, my lord. The only way back is forward. You must get one of the ladies here to marry you. Brian deflated. Well then, I am totally fucked. No need for intemperate language, my lord, said the valet. He seemed honestly sympathetic. If the quality might differ from that to which you are accustomed, please be assured by the standards of the day, you and your sister are quite privileged. You will have shelter and clothing and food. The amusements of the castle may not be the same as they are in the place and time you call home, but the staff and servants will do their best to accommodate you. At Castle Dartmoor, you will find everything a man might need. Brian gave a bark of laughter that surprised even him with its bitter edge. Ha <laughs> Oh, I doubt that very much. He glanced at his sister and saw that Alice had suddenly gone very pale as she realized where Brian was going with all of this. Nothing is available from our time? she asked. No, madam, nothing, said the valet. The letters our guests receive are quite specific. I'm afraid the only way to reconnect with your own time is if Lord Latimer can convince one of the ladies here to agree to be his wife. He shall have ample means and opportunity to press his suit. Brother and sister looked at each other, horror cresting over their faces in a blood-curdling wave. Ryan took a deep breath. By the way, did anyone in the kidnapping crew manage to bring along some insulin when they scooped us up? Insulin? parroted the valet, his smooth facade finally showing a crack of uncertainty. Why no? 
Brian took out his insulin pump and pushed a few buttons. He took a deep breath and looked at his sister. Well, then it looks like in about three days, I'll be dead. End of chapter two.